Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, August 23rd, 2022 edition of the Sands Internet Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I am yet again recording from Jacksonville, Florida. In today's diary, Xavier took a look at the prevalence or lack thereof of native 64-bit malware. It is almost uh, difficult these days to find a CPU that is not 64-bit and many operating systems do support 64-bit these days. But of course, malware usually doesn't have a great reason to give up the 32-bit compatibility, even if it only affects a small percentage of systems. Things like performance or memory use and such, of course, is usually not a big issue for malware. Xavier's attempt to answer the question used the daily archives from Malware Bazaar. Malware Bazaar, unlike Virus Total, makes it easy to download large number of samples. They actually have sort of a daily dump that you can download. So Xavier ended up downloading. 217 gigabytes of malware, which went back to February 2020, so more than two years back. And he used a Yara rule to detect if a binary was either 32-bit or 64-bit. Well, the short answer, only about 6% of binaries were detected as 64-bit code, but among them was only one single DLL file. However, if you look at the graph that he posted, it looks like there was a steady increase in the number of 64-bit samples starting around the beginning of this year. So it's possible that the malware world is switching to 64-bit, which of course has some implications then when it comes to detection. And the use of proxies to mask an attacker's origin isn't really anything new, but the FBI issued a bulletin late last week warning users that they are seeing a surge in the use of proxies specifically for credential stuffing attacks. So credential stuffing, that refers to an attack where an attacker uses usernames and passwords or other personal data that was leaked in prior breaches. And then they just hoped that the site they're attacking, well, that users used the same username and password combination. Of course, it's a little bit hard to defend against this attack because you don't know that your users used the password on other sites. One defense is rate limiting, where I basically only allow a certain number of authentication requests from a particular IP address, regardless the username they're using, because these attacks usually only use a couple of attempts for each username. Now, this of course fails if the attacker has a large number of source IPs at their disposal, and this is sort of where the proxies uh, come in here, and that's why proxies are so popular. Well, uh, you really should use uh, multi-factor authentication for some forms of credential stuffing that may not be an option. For example, I've seen it being used to sign up for a new account where an attacker uses things like social security numbers and such. They stole or were leaked in another breach. In this case, of course, well, uh, this is just where the, atta- the user establishes their connection to the site and they don't have a second factor yet. Sometimes the second factor here is, well, mailing them a letter in order to verify the sign up. The FBI report also lists a few other techniques that you can use to defend against credential stuffing. And of course, don't be part of the problem. Make sure that any proxies that you're using are correctly configured. Researchers from Northwestern University have discovered yet another Linux privilege escalation flaw that they believe is as serious, maybe even more serious, as Dirty Pipe, which was discovered earlier this year. Now, this new vulnerability they called Dirty Cred, uh, it has uh, been present in the Linux kernel for about eight years. And the issue here is that it's possible for an unprivileged Linux user to free an in-use unprivileged credentials, which doesn't really sound that bad. But uh, then by doing so, the user now can wait for a privilege operation to use that freed space and store a privilege credential. And that, of course, then provides the unprivileged user access to privileged 
operations. Unlike Dirty Pipe, this vulnerability apparently does also allow container escape, which of course is a big deal these days with everybody using uh, containers. And did you ever go to a website and the website displayed a message indicating that your browser first needs to be verified to protect the site from a denial of service attacks? Maybe they even let you uh, fill out some kind of capture. Cloudflare, for example, does that. A lot of other um, and denial of service providers and such sometimes uh, use uh, these kind of pages. They typically just use some form of JavaScript and a little bit of user interaction, if at all, to verify that it's a normal browser and not a bot. But Sukuri noticed how attackers are now using these type of pages, of course, uh, fake uh, pages in order uh, to trick users to download malware. So you're going to the site, typically a compromised WordPress blog, of course, and uh, you'll see the message that hey, there is some kind of anti-denial of service uh, procedure in place here. You pass the captcha and then you're being asked to download a binary and execute it in in order to retrieve a code that the site asks for. And that's, of course, where the malware is installed. Difficult for a user to really figure out that this is not legitimate. Yes, you know, for probably most of the people listening to this podcast, it would be uh, pretty obvious, but it's sort of a plausible thing for a user uh, to do. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks again for listening. As always, feedback, very welcome. If you find any errors, if uh, I missed a story that I should have covered, uh, please let me know. And as always, also please recommend this podcast to others. Uh, leave some good comments in the podcast application of your choice. Thanks and talk to you again tomorrow.